afternoon, everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this third session of our conference on genome editing in Europe, new agenda or new disputes. This session is entitled Socioeconomic and Environmental Concerns of GMOs. My name is Catherine Kistner. I'm a program director with the German Science Foundation, BFG. I'm the host for this session. And DFG has been a co-organizer of this conference together with Leopoldina, with our German National Academy of Sciences. I've been looking forward to this session especially, and I'm very pleased to be able to introduce our two co-moderators of this session, Professor Gerald Haug, who is the president of our German National Academy of the Sciences, Leopoldina, and Professor Axel Brackhage, vice president of the DFG, and as a microbiologist, he is also the chairperson of DFG's Senate Commission on Genetic Research. Thank you both very much for agreeing to co-chair this session this afternoon. I really look forward to this exciting and important discussion that I hope we'll be having. Before I hand over just one quick technical remark about how we want to handle questions that we hope will come in from the audience, please use the questions and answers tool that Zoom offers. You will find this questions and answers feature on the control board in the lower part of your screen. You may send questions anytime during the presentations we are going to have, but please note that these questions will be answered only at the end after all presentations uh, have been given. And of course, you may understand that it might be necessary to select if there are too many questions that and time would be too short to answer all of them. And then there is another remark that I have to make another announcement about a program change at rather short notice. Unfortunately, Professor Sabine Schlacke, who was to present on the precautionary principle, cannot be with us this afternoon for unforeseen and very unfortunate circumstances. Luckily, Professor Debra was able to come in at short notice and he would be available to answer at least questions that might be related to the precautionary principle. With that, I'd like to hand over to Professor Hauknow just briefly as another word of introduction. Gerald Hauk is a paleoclimatologist and a marine geologist and he is a director at the Max Planck Institute for chemistry in Mainz, and at the same time a professor of climate geochemistry at the ATH Zurich. Professor Hauck, I'd like to hand over to you. Thank you, Dr. Kistner. Distinguished colleagues, it's a pleasure to also co-welcome you to um, session three. As you've heard, I'm a non-expert on, on the topic. I'm here clearly on a very steep learning curve, very interested in what you do. I look forward to the themes, the sustainable development goals, of course, are at my heart as a climate, paleoclimate person, and to see how they fare in the light of biotechnology is of great interest to, to me, as much as uh, regulation and over-regulation scenarios at the GMOs, uh, it's, a, it's a clearly a heated uh, debate, as well as the biodiversity, biodiversity and food security aspects. I think there is a very interesting session, but without further ado, I should hand over to the experts here, and the expert moderator who will run you through that session is Axel, Axel Brackhage. Uh, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, Gerald, thank you very much for these nice words. I just would like directly go into medias res and we just go to the talks because this is why we are sitting here. And I would like the first speaker to ask the first speaker for his talk, who is uh, Pablo Orozco from the Cornell Alliance for Science. And he's going to speak about biotechnology in light of the Sustainable Development Goals. Please, Pablo.
Yes, thank you. I'm just like to set up my presentation here. If that's okay with everyone. Great. So first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here with such distinguished colleagues. Um, I very much enjoyed the previous talks. And uh, it's, it's, it's a great pleasure for me to present on socioeconomic concerns in light of the sustainable development goals. Now, my presentation will be mostly through the voice of our fellows, um, the, the heart and blood of our program at the Alliance for Science. So I'd like to start with, even if it's repeating some of what my distinguished colleagues have said, uh, I'd like to start with the fact um, we will have more drought, we will have more environmental stress, and we'll have a billion or so more mouths to feed. But we can't use more water, we can't use more lands, and we can't use more inputs in general. So if we want dynamic and sustainable agricultural systems without more input, our ability to improve the basic characteristics of the organisms on which we rely on becomes very important. Now that's why generally plant breeding has a history of innovation and also why biotechnology is a tool that holds so much promise and can be considered within the UN's 2030 agenda for sustainable development, we've, which we've seen in different um, in documents. Now the socioeconomic and environment impacts of biotech have been recorded through different studies um, and we can say that they clearly fit into the SDGs context mostly because they can help alleviate a social toll that is brought about by climate change and the lack of sustainable um, practices. Now of course not all of them not all of these applications will will comply with this but there are some that definitely fit the bill. Now when a clear example of that is BT brinjal in Bangladesh. And when we talk about BT brinjal, I'd like to go through the voice of our fellows who are, who are, who are the boots on the ground for these technologies. And they're the ones that are allowed to talk to farmers like Milon Mia, who has, thanks to this BT crop, cut his pesticide use by 90% and clearly earns extra income. Now that's, a, that's, that's one particular story, but if, you, if we take a step back and we look at the facts, we can see how this BT Rangel, this GM crop has, been, has shown to, reduce, to help reduce poverty by allowing farmers to save on pesticide costs, incre increase their net return sixfold and their gross revenue. And it has direct impact on the reduction of the use of pesticides. And so there is studies that really demonstrate how this technology can be used in light of the sustainable development goals. And that, that's why our fellow, like, for example, Arif Hossein, not only is an advocate and a, a clear believer in this technology, but also went the further mile and created its own organization, a local organization that works to promote access to agricultural innovation precisely because he has seen the benefits of this technology and how it can really be part of a poverty reducing strategy. Now, if we take it one step further and then we talk about gene editing and we, we can see how this technology has the potential to shape how we use agricultural biotechnologies not on its own, but as part of a conventional of other conventional breeding programs and in combination with other efforts. I think everybody here can agree that when we're talking about reaching sustainability, we don't really believe in crowding up out other options, but we I I would think that everybody agrees that coexistence should be it possible to reach these development goals, which really transcend um, policy or science because these SDGs are really about the humans we want to help. Now, if we think about that and we think about the poverty reduction aspect of these new technologies, we see how we can use technologies to create, to, to create crops who have traits that can really actually benefit local communities, local farmers in a myriad of ways. From drought tolerance to, in, to increased grain, 
that can ultimately result in economic benefits for the, for the farmers. Now, if we keep on going down the SDGs, we, we can see um, how uh, uh, one that comes to mind quickly is golden rice. And that's because biofortification is really at the heart of what other UN agencies like FAO have thought about when we think about reducing hidden hunger. Now, this can come in different forms and different shapes, and the traits that are being worked on currently are, are, are go across the board. We can talk about biofortified bananas, we can talk about improved rice, we can talk about, talk about viral resistant banana or healthier rice. But I think I have had the pleasure to meet researchers whose thought process goes, we want local varieties to keep their, the, what makes them local, but also add value by improve their quality. Now, again, as I mentioned initially, my talk really, I really want to focus on our fellows' voices who, for example, Modesta from Nigeria, who is working on improving flavor content in tomato, Navneet Kaur from India, who is working on enriching B carotene in bananas, and Murenga, um, who is working with the Wema Maze project in Kenya. Now, these fellows don't just work in the lab, but they also are aware that they need to voice these, the, what they're doing and what they believe in in different forms. Um, because innovative new biotechnologies is really a cross-cutting tool that can allow local, publicly funded, low-risk research solutions. And they can be used in a myriad of ways to challenge, to, to address the challenges that we can see regularly in climate change. And now if we, if we pause for a second and look at how we can combat climate change with these new technologies, we talk about heat, drought, and salt tolerant crops. And uh, I, I, a couple of our fellows are working in different areas of the world that really show how different the approach can be. Um, and this, this is a, a, a recent um, development in Chile. Uh, um, the plant abiotic stress for sustainable agriculture is working on um, kiwi and tomato, uh, tomato that is going to be drought resistant and salt tolerant. Now, this, knowing what we know about Chile, it's, it, it's really looking to create sustainability within their agricultural system. And then if we switch the page or turn the page and we talk about Wema and the different drought resistant mazes that are being developed for an area in Africa, for example, Tanzania, Kenya, Zimbabwe, Uganda, and others, they're really talking about helping farmers face those direct consequences of climate change and reach sustainability. So that I, I, I wanted to bring that up because it, I, I think it really shows how this cross-cutting tool can be used in different contexts and different parts of the world. Um, again, one of our fellows, Nkechi Isaac, a science communicator who believes in how science can help constant development, really sheds a light on the fact that there are farmers that right now need these crops and that um, if we can work together as a society to develop these crops in a safe and a responsible way, these are, these, this technology can definitely benefit stories precisely like Selma, who is really facing the consequences of climate change. I, I, following that, go, following down the line of the SDGs, we can see how from, from our fellows, initiatives have begun much like uh, Farming Food Future Bangladesh in, in Bangladesh, uh, in the same way, Women Who Farm Africa, who is three amazing fellows who, who begun this organization and really demonstrate the power of partnership partnering for these goals. Now, they, they are, we are work partnering with them to do um, stakeholder engagement, and not only that, but also capacity building, 
specifically just on farming practices now, and they promote gender equality and really demonstrate the ethos of the Alliance for Science. In general, I think Kle uh, Masiga from Uganda really said it best when he mentioned that every field is using scientific innovation to advance and there should be no exception in plant eating. I think in a post-pandemic world where we know that our food systems are being, uh, will be taxed and we are definitely facing uh, global food security problems, we, we need to use all the tools we have to be able to overcome these challenges. So to, to end with, with, the, with my, my talk, I really wanted to narrow in on the potential implications of the social and economic con concerns and how they could be included into the decision-making process. Because when you're thinking about establishing biosafety frameworks that will allow different products to go from um, lab to commercialization, and you want to integrate sustainability and allow innovation to go forward, we really have to balance information. We really need to understand, we, we really need to take into account the social and economic benefits of, again, not every application, but there is definitely distinct data and distinct information that allow, that shows that this technology can really help us achieve the sustainable development goals. So when we think about the social and economic concerns, we, as it's been mentioned before in different panels, we need to allow innovation in a safe and responsible manner. So we need to really think what are the issues relevant to the technology decision-making process. Workable systems with clear rules and standards will facilitate the different develop, public sector developers to really drive towards sustainability and all of the other, all different types of developers. So an over-complex regulatory system can mean high compliance costs. And what would, we would not like to see is that potentially regulatory delays could reduce the number of technologies that public sector um, institutions can present to the world as, as we've seen in BT Brinjal. And we wouldn't want a repeat of some of the few products that are out there that have been put forth by public sector like golden rice having 15 years in the to get to help the end user is a little too long so the the objective of, of my presentation was to really allow a platform to voice our fellows who are all over the world who um, really understand the technology and how they can that it can allow local solutions for local problems brought on by the big picture problem, which is climate change, lack of sustainable practices, and poverty in general. For that, I, I think I'm on time, so I will stop there and thank everyone again for allowing me the time for this presentation. Okay. Pablo, thank you very much for your talk. Um, we can move on and I would ask uh, Dr. Monica Mesma from the Swiss FIBL Research Institute of Organic Agriculture to speak about the impact of future GMO regulation scenarios on the organic sector. Frau Mesma, thanks a lot for coming. We are looking forward to your talk, thanks. screen yes we can see it but i think you have to switch it on uh, yes i okay. think yeah. okay now it's better yes now it's perfect thank you okay. very much <laughs> okay then thank you very much for the invitation and i'm quite glad to be here in this uh, very uh, interesting session and i'm uh, have to apologize that i can't join the morning but i also got informed on a short notice 
and I'm glad to be now in the session three. And I would like to show you also what, what is the impact of future GMO regulations on the organic sector. And I just want to uh, start with the organic sector in Europe. I also want to show you that we have 13.8 million hectares of organic farmland. That is about 7.7% 7 .7 of the total farm area that we have. And we have quite a big number of farmers and uh, processors that are working in the field and the whole value or turnover of the retail of the organic sector is 37.4 billion Euro, uh, euros and uh, the, there is also an annual growth of uh, plus 7.6 or 7.7 percent and this is actually something that is going on since uh, several years and I think for the food market the organic market is probably one of the most uh, strongest one that is growing and also we um, are quite happy about the new uh, EU farm to fork strategy that was published this May that aims to increase the share of organic farmland to 25 percent within the next 10 years. I think that is a very ambitious goal and uh, we really uh, think that plant breeding uh, has to contribute to achieve this. Uh, this goal and to make uh, also the organic uh, uh, farm farming uh, not only very uh, sustainable and environmental friendly but also highly uh, productive. Uh, just to come back uh, to the principles of organic agriculture, the principles are based on four issues, on the principle of health, the principle of ecology, the principle of fairness, and also the principle of care, that's also called the precautionist principle. What is very specific about the organic sector that it is value-based and process-oriented, and it is defined by the organic sector and was later taken over by the EU regulation. We have seen several years uh, quite intensive uh, discussions and debates about the compatibility of breeding techniques uh, with organic agriculture and this had been discussed at different levels and I just want to point this out because usually it causes a lot of misunderstanding and unfruitful debate if people talking on different levels and not going to understand the other side. So on one side there is the, the issue on on risk, on the precautionist principle, the risk for human, animal, or plant health, but also soil fertility and environmental in general is very important. And here the organic sector is probably more on the very uh, precautionist side uh, before applying any new technology. But then moreover, there is this ethical issue and that is uh, not so much related to risk benefit uh, evaluations, but it's related to uh, how far shall it be allowed to modify organisms directly at the DNA level. So it is an, an ethical value. Do we have the right to do that? Should we do that? Should human, whatever we are able to do with our science, uh, apply this? And are we capable of really using the new tools in a good way? And then there's the other level that is more on the socioeconomic issues that it's related to intellectual property rights. Uh, it concerns also farmer privilege. Uh, there's a strong concern about the market concentration of the seed companies uh, worldwide and also the dependency of the farmers on hybrid seed so that they more and more lose the, their independence on farm safe seed. And uh, on the other side, there's also the expectation and the trust of the organic consumers, what they expect from the organic food they're going to buy in the shops. In the, new, uh, in the European Union, uh, organic agriculture is uh, GMO-free by definition, and uh, GMO is uh, forbidden in the organic production uh, and processing that is already in the present regulation and this has been confirmed in the new regulation that will take into force either January 2021 or might be delayed by one year due to COVID uh, to January 2022. I'm just coming a bit back to the ethical issues that have been discussed uh, just to clarify you what are the major issues that have been discussed and there was uh, quite heavy debates about what is the, the smallest entity that need to be respected and how can the integrity of a plant be respected 
And then it came down that the genome should be respected as indivisible enti entity so that there should be no technical or physical interference below. That's so that means uh, no intervention with isolated DNA, for example. And it went further to the discussion that actually the cell is uh, the smallest funct functional unit from one cell a whole plant can regenerate. And that therefore this uh, functional unit should be indivisible or respected the integrity of this unit. And that would, for example, also prevent cell fusion where you take uh, isolated cells, where you remove the cell wall, where you uh, destroy one of the nucleus and then uh, fuse the different cells, for example, to make uh, cytoplasmatic male sterility of cauliflower or broccoli, which is a common practice in vegetable breeding. Um, what is also important is that the reproducibility of the species should be maintained. That means that the plant, even without humans, should not be modified in such a way that they, it cannot uh, reproduce itself without humans. And there should also be no legal or technical barriers that restrict breeders' right. For example, uh, when you have um, uh, uh, hybrids, then you uh, have a the farmer cannot uh, use that, or if you have, uh, for example, um, a vegetable or cauliflower that is male sterile, then you cannot use it in your own breeding program. And of course, if you uh, apply patents, then it's also restricted for breeders to use it in their own breeding program. The, the other issue that is discussed is about natural crossing barriers uh, that should not be... Uh, overcome. So that means that uh, crossing barriers might be uh, extended to a certain extent by bridge crosses, uh, but not by um, bringing together uh, species that are not, that cannot cross fertilize uh, in nature. And um, also quite debated is the, that we should promote open pollinated varieties as an alternative to F1 hybrids that are taking more and more Moreover, even now in the cereals that have been for many centuries been uh, line breeding that are now transverted to hybrid seed. And the reason is not only that the hybrid vigor is so much higher, but also for the reason that the farmer can't use farm safe seed. And uh, one of the very big issues that was discussed is that there should be transparency, transparency what kind of parental material is used, but also transparency in the breeding techniques that are used. There are several uh, positions of the organic sector, how to comply with the new breeding techniques or the new genomic techniques, as they call it now. There has been quite earlier position paper of ECOPB, that is the European Consortium of Plant Breeding. They made a position paper on organic plant breeding. Uh, to define what we understand under organic plant breeding and also to see what, what are the limits and uh, which techniques uh, comply and which do not comply. And this was also then further developed in the, on the international level and I from international, that is the, the uh, organization of all the organic movements. And uh, there was a position paper, new breeding techniques, um, Submitted in 2017, it was uh, as went for the consultation for the different members, and then the final approval was at the General Assembly in November 2017. And the main outcome of this um, position paper or this booklet, it's more a booklet than a position paper, is that it uh, shows clarity and transparency on the criteria that are used to determine which breeding techniques are compatible with organic farming and um, this and also to uh, it differentiates between what is allowed or which cultivars are allowed for organic cultivation and it, which cultivars are allowed or which techniques are allowed to do organic plant breeding and um, the whole uh, exercise was that not for that the sector doesn't have to develop each and every new technique on its own, but that are criteria defined and based on the criteria, then it's quite easy to evaluate the different uh, uh, 
uh, methods if they would be compatible or not compatible. There is uh, also the uh, European um, IFOAM Organics Europe uh, made a position paper and had collected quite a lot of information on the new genomic techniques, uh, which are not in their view are not compatible with the organic farming and uh, should also be declared uh, as GMO according to the EU regulation and be labeled accordingly. And there's also a German paper since we're having this uh, German uh, organizations that are doing this webinar. It's from the Bundesverband Ökologische Lebensmittelwirtschaft. These are the, the association of the organic uh, food industry. They put a position paper also in 2018 that they also say that technical intervention with low the cell level should not be compatible with the organic agriculture and that also natural fertility need to be remained. I think what is common to all these documents and all this discussion in the organic sector is that transparency and traceability is a very high value for the sector. And, uh, and only this allows the freedom of choice for the organic farmers and the organic consumers. What is now the impact of the, the present scenario of the regulation that I call scenario one, according to the European Court of Justice decision in July 2018, genome editing is regulated under the GMO regulation. Therefore, the products must be declared and they're not permitted in the organic sector. In addition, there are about 17 European countries that ban GMO cultivation that make use of the so-called opt-out order. That means that uh, they ban uh, GMO even if they would be allowed in Europe. And um, the consequences from uh, gene editing and products that are entering the market and even if they're declared as GMO is that the organic sector and the, especially the organic value chain needs to follow all measures to keep the organic sector free of GMO and to avoid any contamination from seed to the blade. So that takes a lot of effort. It is a very high cost for T GMO testing and uh, organic certification and to get the GMOs free certificate from different um, partners all along the value chain. There is always a risk of declassification due to unintended contamination. And the most difficult is to maintain purity of organic seed, as for example, uh, GMO is grown at the moment as uh, BT maize in Spain. The organic sector have get, given up the maize growing in Spain as it was impossible to have GMO free maize in Spain. So until now, all these costs are paid by the organic sector and not by the GMO industry and also not by the, those who are using the GMO. If we come now to the future GMO regulation and to scenario two, that would mean, for example, that genome editing is no longer regulated as GMO. So it is expected that then the technique will be applied in many breeding programs in Europe and also products derived from genome editing will be produced in Europe and also be imported. Uh, however, the, that it's not called GMO will not uh, mean that the organic sector will embrace these techniques as they already stated that the novel genomic techniques that involve uh, genetic engineering in their process uh, will not be compatible to the organic sector. Therefore, it's for the organic sector also not very relevant if you see big changes in the final product as for the organic sector in general, the process is a very important part and even the certification of an organic apple is not based because you see a big difference on the product, but because you can certify that the whole process has been done in different ways that you have started with different plant material, that you started with different farming systems, that you have um, taken different care of the landscape. So the whole system of uh, agriculture is very different. And uh, for this, I think it's very important, as I said before, that we have full transparency. And this is actually very important that the organic sector can maintain its integrity. For this, we need labeling and traceability all along the value chain. We also need detection methods to minimize unintended contamination and also fraud. And uh, 
we also expect that there will be a very high risk of contamination and that this risk will increase with the increased commercialization of genome editing derived products. And this will also increase the costs for separate value chains and for certification. That also means that there will be a, uh, in the already now, but even in the midterm, there will be a separation in organic or new genomic tool free breeding processes compared to conventional breeding programs that are applying these methods. That will also result that organic farmers will have a smaller choice of cultivars and also the organic breeders will have less crossing parents available and this will hamper to participate on the general breeding progress as they do at the moment. When we come to scenario three, that would be the one that uh, the genome editing is no longer regulated and it is not declared. And in this case, it will be actually impossible to keep uh, new genomic technologies out of the organic sector. That would mean that the organic sector will lose its credibility and trust. Farmers and consumers will no longer be able to, to decide on their uh, free will, if what kind of food or what kind of seed they want to choose. And it might also cause a very strong decline of the organic sector in Europe which will have a very negative impact on economy, environment, and the society. As we still see, and it is also has been acknowledged by the European Commission, that uh, organic agriculture is kind of a forerunner of sustainable agriculture, as it developed systems that are not exploiting the system, but working with the system and working with nature in order to make sure that we have also in 10 and 20 years or in 30 years uh, fertile soil with a good fertility where we can grow our plants. So in, in conclusion, the, for us, the new GMO or new genomic technology regulation, however it will be called, it must request full transparency and traceability of GMO and new genomic techniques to safeguard the integrity of the organic sector and the freedom of choice for citizens. The legal framework must ensure that the organic sector can remain GMO and NT free. And uh, this is important because otherwise we will not be able to develop 25% of organic farmland in 10 years. The legal framework should also protect the income and the livelihood of, of organic farmers and processors in such a way that the contamination of non-GM or NGT material should be prevented by the GMO producer in the first place, and that detection costs to identify fraud, to identify fraud or unintended contamination uh, should be in line with the polluter pays principle and not those that are really don't want to use the technique. That also means for the breeding and the organic breeding that genetic resources need to be protected, preserved and maintained to stay GMO and NTG free to allow this uh, further uh, establishment and uh, flourishing of the organic sector. Also cultivars and animal breeds acceptable for organic sector need to be identified as that it will also strongly restrict the the availability and uh, I think and quite important is also that greater public resources are needed for research and development of breeding innovations that are acceptable for the organic sector. There have been now three European projects working on boosting organic seed and plant breeding in Europe that are working on this issue but of course they have a limited time frame and seeing the the big demand that we have to develop, um, it is uh, quite a lot of effort possible. And I just also want to stress at this point uh, that organic plant breeding doesn't mean that we are not using innovations, but our innovations are based on breeding for diversity, we breeding for mixed cropping systems, we are breeding for improved plant microbe, uh, soil microbe interaction, we are trying to develop new cultivar types, uh, we're trying to breed for agroforestry systems, so we try to to use organic plant breeding not only to fix one trade or one one 
problem that we have, but we really want to use plant breeding to develop more sustainable farming systems uh, that allow us to continue our healthy food production. And yeah, the last demand that we would have is that intellectual property rights need to be fair to all and it should be prevented that uh, cultivars uh, or plant species are protected by patent, which uh, do not allow the breeders to use it for further breeding. And with this, I would like to thank your attention and uh, thanks. Yeah, okay. Dr. Mesmer, thank you very much for your presentation. And as we said before, unfortunately, Professor Schlacke isn't able to attend at this time. And I would like to ask uh, instead Professor Dedra from uh, Passau uh, to have a couple of comments because, I mean, this was the next topic was more on the precautionary principles and the comparison between the European Union and the Anglo-American uh, approach. And I don't know, uh, Professor Dedra, please, what you would like to state now. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Backhage. Um, yes, I was asked to step in uh, because uh, my colleague Sabine Schlacke obviously is unfortunately prevented uh, from holding this talk. Now, I would like to make um, only three points. So uh, please, uh, I have to apologize. I didn't prepare any slides, so I will speak without slides, without PowerPoint presentation. Let me make uh, simply three points about the precautionary principle. The first point is, there is a serious misconception about the applicability of the um, precautionary principle. Um, it is often held that the precautionary principle is not really associated or is not related to science. What is true is, that um, the precautionary principle applies in cases of scientific uncertainty. That is true. But that doesn't mean that the precautionary principle is um, not related to science. To the contrary, the precautionary principle applies only if scientists see at least the possibility of risk. And this is fully in line with the EZJ jurisprudence, the jurisprudence of the European Court of Justice. And please let me simply quote from uh, its jurisprudence. Quote, a correct application of the precautionary principle presupposes first identification of the potentially negative consequences for health or the environment. And second, more importantly, a comprehensive assessment of the risk to health based on the most reliable scientific data available and the most recent results of international research. So clearly, the application of the precautionary principle, the invocation of the precautionary principle is related to science. So any precautionary measures must not be based on purely speculative or hypothetical considerations. My second point is also addressing a misconception uh, of the uh, precautionary principle. Um, and this is that people think that the precautionary principle allows for, or even calls for the most stringent restrictive or prohibitive regulation. But again, to the contrary, this is a misconception. To the contrary, the European Commission already 20 years ago in 2000 um, issued a communication on the precautionary principle and its application. And in that communication of 2000, the European Commission mentioned five principles which should guide the application of the precautionary principle. And these principles are the principle of proportionality, the principle of non-discrimination, the principle of consistency, the principle to balance benefits and costs of action as well of inaction, and fifth, the principle to review precautionary measures in light of scientific developments. And that means that any a precautionary regulatory framework needs to be dynamic by nature. 
That means it needs to be dynamic, taking needs to be able to adapt to the progress in science and technology, needs to be able to take into account developments in science and technology. And that leads me to my third and last point. Um, the European legislator, but also including the national legislators, did not comply with the precautionary principle, not because the GMO regulation was not strict enough, but rather because the legislator did not take into account scientific knowledge or the progress in scientific knowledge and um, scientific experience. Because what we see and what we know is we used genetic engineering for 30 years, and we also did a lot of safety research using taxpayers' money. And um, after 30 years, no results actually, um, no results were achieved, which revealed risks associated with the technique, with the technique of genetic engineering. Another point, and this is the very last point, uh, is that, um, uh, that also the principle of consistency um, well, is not be complied with. Why is that so? The principle of consistency means that we should not apply different levels of protection for health and environment to same or similar situations. So in cases of same and similar situations, we should apply the same level of protection. But what we do if we subject genome edited organisms to the current GMO framework, we apply a high level of protection to genome edited organisms, but we apply a low level of protection to organisms resulting from the additional breeding techniques. Even though both organisms may possess the very same modification. And for this reason, um, it doesn't seem in compliance with the precautionary principle if we subject all genome edited organisms to the GMO framework. So this was my short statement. Thank you very much. Professor Dederer, thank you very much for your statement and that you stepped in and we have you available then for the questions later on. So we will continue to our last speaker on this session. And this will be Professor Alexandra Maria Klein from the University of Freiburg. And she's going to speak about the conservation of biodiversity in agricultural landscapes without compromising food security. Please. Yeah, thank you. Um, do you hear me? Yes, and we see perfectly your slides. Great. So I will just continue. I'm going to talk more about biodiversity in agriculture, yeah, in agriculture landscapes and how to compromise this with, with food security. I might say a couple of things that were already said this morning, but um, I will give some results or let's say some scientific evidence for it. Um, so we know that biodiversity or let's say just insects are in decline and we don't know it um, since last year, we even know it longer. I don't know if you see the publication. Do you see, um, because I can't see it here on my screen, do you see from where the publication is? I hope you see it. It's from no. 2014. Unfortunately, I cannot see it. I, ah, I okay. Just, just mention it, thanks. Okay. I mentioned because I have for all of my slides the backup of the papers, but in the end I have a summary of all papers, so everybody who is interested could just look at the summary. Um, so you see um, already from, yeah, in 2014 we had a pretty good evidence for abundance of Lepidoptera here, uh, of butterflies that they are in decline. And um, coming to the EU level, because we will release from the Leopoldina um, a report in two weeks, and there we came up with these results, um, or you probably can't see it, but here from, 19, um, from the 19th to 2016, we have a decline in the EU, it's from um, many EU member states, um, almost all, we had a decline of butterflies for 30 years. And you see the up and downs. So, for example, the uh, first 10 years, first you had a decline and suddenly it goes back uh, to the value we had 10 years before. This is why it's really difficult um, to see trends um, in insect abundance or diversity. 
We also see this um, for other species. Here it's an endangered bee species. And um, this population dynamic is from a protected area in southern Germany. Um, so this means we have populations of, this is an endangered, a rare species, but also of common species, of very common species. And we have these, at least in Europe, this is from Germany, in protected areas and in non-protected areas. And this is also from our report. You can't see it, uh, but I give all the um, evidence in the end of my pre presentation. I'm uh, just coming to birds across the EU. Here it's a change in abundance of 167 bird species. And when you just look at the species that are depending on forest, you see a decline, but it's not really dramatic. But when you look at the species um, that are maintained or that are really relying on agricultural landscape, you see a drastic decline. And this is not just for birds. We see this and we know this. We have pretty good data in Germany also for insect. So populations of one common species are declining and are still in decline. So this is from the 19th to 2015. And we even have a better data now. Um, and they especially do it in agricultural landscapes. So now I'm coming back to something what Katja Becker uh, said this morning. We cannot just go back uh, to what we have pre-industrial and I totally agree with her. But anyway, when you look at the causes of biodiversity decline, you see first habitat loss, second land use intensification. And I just make it simple and say land use int intensification also includes insecticides. And uh, this will come with our Leopoldina report, of course, when we have these nice landscapes with lots of forests, we have many, many species, high diversity, and uh, when you have a simple landscape, you have less diversity. What is also there, are, of course, many other causes, um, but these are the most important causes at the moment, according to our literature. But I just want to make the point, there is, of course, a publication bias in here. When we look in five years time, I'm pretty sure climate change is coming first because climate change is just going to start and we are just coming with the results. And uh, then we have a real problem <laughs> because climate change is facing food security and is probably um, have a real um, drastic impact on biodiversity. So um, here in this picture, you see already there's a big trade-off in conservation biodiversity or to conserve biodiversity and on the same hand, conserve food security. But I would like to make this point even um, in, an, in a different context from my own research. Um, so this is actually a figure that comes from an EU project that we finished a year ago. It's um, apple production, and um, we counted bees, we counted uh, um, any predators or any beneficial insects and all the pests, and we also measured production, apple production in the end. This was in 84 um, apple orchards across the EU, and half of them was managed organically and half of them conventionally. And what you see, it's a pretty complicated graph, so I just want to make sure you understand the main messages. Organic management have, of course, of, not of course, it has a benefit of all the natural enemies, of all the richness of beneficial arthropods. But um, interestingly, not on bees. For bees, flowers, if you have a flower strip in there, was most important, more important than um, switching from integrated pest management to organic pest management. And if you have these beneficial insects, you have less damage, um, different kind of damage. I'm not going into the details. But anyway, these, um, I can't really point to it, but when you see these red, um, these red things, these are negative um, correlations. And this means even when you have all these benefits for biodiversity and organic production, um, in the end, you still have a negative effect on food production. And I think we have to take this seriously. This is a speciality crop, it's an apple, so you will find different results in um, other crops. But anyway, we have to consider that um, just going organic um, will not, um, yeah, prevent 
or will not increase biodiversity without compromising food security. But this was said before, I just want to show some results. Um, so what are the actions? What can we do? And I'm just um, rising a couple of things. I can't go into the details, but of course we need to change the cap. And this is um, what we bring in our report in, in real detail. Um, we, in the report of the Leopoldina, we really go to the point that we have to transform society, less food waste and so on. Um, and we have to change the agriculture markets. We have to go to the law. We need to adapt some laws and we need to make sure that the regulation works because we see that in agriculture, not always the regulation really works. And we need innovative concepts, not, in just, uh, not, in I, not only in IPM, I really think we also need it in organic agriculture and this brings to the point what is innovative. It could be artificial intelligence. We made this point in our report because artificial intelligence um, can promote small scale farming. For example, when you have robots, this is a big robot there. I didn't find a picture of the smaller ones, um, but the future will be much smaller ones um, likely, and then you can promote small scale farming. And of course, we also made the point that breeding is important breeding for diseases and climate risk. We know all this. Um, and then coming to breeding, we have, of course, the advanced conventional breeding. And um, we can go for novel breeding with gene-edited GMOs. And here I'm just meaning CRISPR-Cas, um, as it's getting too complicated when I mention all of the um, gene-edited methods. This morning I asked this question, um, is there actually a table or do we have good research showing the advantages and the disadvantages of all the different methods of the methods in conventional breeding and the methods in um, yeah, gene edited breeding? And the question was, uh, we don't see any risk so far. And I'm always getting this question. I was searching for such a table and I even started with such a table. There's actually no research. There's nothing really comprehensive available, just to make this point. Um, yeah, so what we have to do, um, I think we should be open to chain edited methods, or I call it novel breeding, because I think you need a new term for it anyway. You can't go with an old term in order to convince society. Um, but risk assessment, of course, need um, to evaluate or need to ask the question how unintended changes at the genetic level impact the whole organisms. We have these kind of research, but we don't have really research um, showing the risk assessment so far. How is this um, interacting with the environment? And this brings me just to explain you what I mean with that. Novel organisms, of course, are just different genotypes. And um, for me, it's from the bi biological point of view, it's not a different if it's a conventional breeding or a novel breeding, it's a different genotypes. And we know from many different research, also from my own research, we are also working with different genotypes and looking how the food webs are changing. And there is a huge effect on diversity, on food webs, on functions, um, also in adjacent ecosystems. So if you do any risk assessment, if you are doing new research, you have to consider this. Then of course, gene coded toxins do not only affect the target organisms, they affect also the non-target organisms. We know this from um, GT in mice, uh, but also in any other GT crops that they affect many different organisms. So going to a toxin that's just coming for a plant also need this different um, yeah, this research angle coming from the ecological theories. Um, yeah, and all these really needs to um, need to be included in, in risk assessment. Um, just to sum this up. I, oh, oh, I need to I need to sum it up. Um, so 
I would say novel plant or even animal breeding can potentially contribute to biodiversity food production challenges. It looks like this that it can be, but we need many more research to figure this out. And we need it from inter and transdisciplinary point of view. And just one point, um, these novel breeding should by no means be the main solution to secure future food production. We need these other concepts and there was, you can't see it, um, but there's um, just a new, um, a couple of new publications in Nature, in nature Sustainability and uh, that bring a couple of ideas up. And here are all the references because you couldn't see them. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for Klein. Thanks a lot for your presentation. And now we have time. Unfortunately, we are already <laughs> basically over time, but I would suggest we, we have a lot of questions in our F&A &F &A, and I just would like maybe to, to select some questions that each of the presenters is involved. And we had quite some questions also addressing um, Ah, yeah, thank you very much. We we had some some questions um, addressing the um, the talk from Monica Mesma. If I could ask you maybe to start, and and I try to to summarize them a bit. There are several from here from Cecilia Gonzalez and also from Detlef Barch, and it's basically saying that the plant breeding principle also is human intervention. And why do organic movement seems to go back to the beginning of crop breeding centuries ago when we can use more precise technology? And also, uh, also related to this question was the question, why do you define DNA as an individable entity? You know, because also myself, I'm also a molecular biologist. I mean, DNA is changing all the time in all cells everywhere. Thank you very much for Mifsa. Maybe you can. Um, yeah, I think the, the discussion, what is the smallest unit? Is it the cell or the DNA that was uh, actually, it came up with the cell that this is really the, the smallest part that we can regenerate as a whole. So it, and there you have all the information, everything it's included that the plant can reproduce itself. And, um, and why the organic sector is, uh, we, we don't want to start from 50 or 100 years ago. We, we actually do innovations, but we see the innovations much more like it was presented in the other talk. And we also think that uh, uh, gene editing without going into big risk and benefit discussions, but I think the, it's also overestimated because even if with uh, gene editing, you can edit 10 or 100 genes, but the job of a plant breeder is to get in harmony 20,000 genes. So, it is not only that you can fix some part and I actually see some risk if we focus all, all scientists now focusing on one single technique that we actually losing what we have learned um, about quantitative genetics and that maybe in apple breeding people start uh, stopping to make crosses because then it might be much more easy and uh, much faster commercialized if you then take one apple gala that is all grown all over and then you put in uh, something against fire blight, something about against cap, something against aphid, but still you have the same genotype and there, and the same is true that it's now discussed with the banana. Where we have uh, already in the 60s made uh, the big mistake that we had all the same core shell banana all over, then it became susceptible to fusarium. Then there was a big uh, disaster then we were looking for something others. Then now it's Cavendish and we have not learned anything of history. We grow Cavendish all over the world. And now we say, okay, without CRISPR-Cas, we can't save this anymore. But I think we, I think we need to balance a bit what, what the new techniques can be. And we have to be also maybe a bit more humble to see that the, that the organism is a bit more than just the sum of the different genes then you can put together in like you think that they would react because in what has been shown e even also with all the GMO uh, trials in the past that 
the final product at the end reacts different because the gene expression might be different. There might be different feedback loops. So I think we don't know everything of the plant yet. And uh, and so for for the the organic sector, it, it is not. It is was just a decision because it's a it's a it's a private sector. It is free to decide on its own. It also decided not to use soluble uh, nitrogen fertilizer that was decided, uh, I don't know, 60 or 70 years ago. At that point in time, there was no scientific evidence that there would be that this would lead to salinity and soil erosion if you overdo it. So I think uh, we see our role that by not using the techniques that we're becoming much more inventive to explore other paths. Thank you very much. Before I move on, I just would like to ask the speakers, but you can think about it. There is a question whether you would allow to share uh, your transparencies with the audience, but you can think about it. And then we would, of course, not, I would not put pressure on you yet. Just think about it at the end, we can, we can do that. I would like to continue with a question, which was now first, I think to, to Professor Dederer, and, and one question from Holger Ophoff was, in the light of precautionary principle, by what time dimension do you consider history of safe use? 10 years, 30, 10,000? Difficult question, I must say. Yes, indeed, it's a very difficult question. Now, when you talk about the history of safe use, this is a question about a period of time. And the first problem is, what is the starting point for that period of time? Is it the first use in a laboratory, or is it the first use in a field trial, or is it the first use uh, in cultivation on a commercial scale? So that's one problem. Another problem regarding uh, the question, what is the period of time that constitutes a history of safe use is, uh, what, are, what are the scientific uncertainties? Do we have to start from scratch with regards to science or is there already sufficient scientific knowledge you know, so, so as to assess what could happen if we make use of this or that uh, technique. And then also, I think the period of time for history of safe use depends on the kind of risks we are talking about. Do we talk about risks to human health or do we talk about risk to the environment? I mean, the environment is very important as well, but if you talk about risk to human health, a food bomb risk, for example, I think we should be, of course, very careful. And this would call perhaps for a longer period of time that could constitute a history of safe use. And another issue could be for defining that period of time, the principle or concept of substantial equivalence. So if there is a new organism derived from genome editing, but this is substantially equivalent to an organism uh, derived from traditional mutagenesis, that may call for a shorter period of time that constitutes the history of safe use because looking into the past and all the experience we gained in the past um, with regard to the organism derived from traditional mutagenesis, that may suffice to assess the safety of that organism. So I cannot give you any, com uh, any number, any concrete number. It's 10 or 30 or th uh, 10,000 years. It may be 10 years only. Uh, it may be 30 years, but for sure it's not 10,000 years. Thank you very much. As a, as a biochemist, I would like to add that it depends also the frequency, how often it is used and it's very often used. You know, if you, if you use it only once every 100 years, of course it might be longer. But this technology is used by thousands of laboratories at the moment, so it's really also the frequency. I would like to continue. There is one qu a question from Astrid Österreicher, um, and I don't get it perfectly, but it's, I think it's a, it's a complex question, but I would like to frame it. And Macy also, Professor Deder and Professor Klein, you, it's, it's, it's addressed to Professor Klein, actually, sorry. And now I got it, what a bit difficult. Um, do you think from an ecological perspective, that the statement by Leopoldina and DFG sufficiently reflect upon risks that new genomic techniques might pose? First part of the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that if, I, I read the question actually earlier because it came up uh, really early. I think it's mainly um, if I think there, there will be environmental risk um, 
in the end. I think from my perspective, of course, if we have a new genotype, there is a risk. But this risk is also there with a common breeding program. Yes. The, only, um, the only difference I see is that we have a new technique that is much faster, that is more precise. So um, this has, of course, advantages, but might bring also more risk. But we have no research on that. I don't see any research on this. So I would argue um, we should start doing more research uh, in all of these directions. Um, not forever, um, but we need, of course, especially from the ecological point of view, because in former times, in all of these discussions, um, ecologists were mainly not included, um, I think. And um, so I think we, we should I want to <laughs> I want only to broaden your statement. <laughs> okay. And but can I, I hope I have answered this. And um, can I make a, 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 a point from my side? So when I look at our research, I really have a problem in having this black and white discussion, organic and conventional. And um, no GMOs in convention, uh, in organic, but in conventional and IP we have. I think we need to broaden this. I really think we need new categories. Why not having a category with organic um, that has genome editing as a new category? Or why not um, organic that really use no pesticides at all, pesticides at all because we using biological pesticides and organic. Um, from, our data, I see such a variation. We have a really good organic growers. They have high biodiversity and high yield, but we also have this on the conventional side. So I find this really hard to go with these black and white discussions. But I think this is the reason also, I hope why we are sitting here. Yes, Pablo, please, you just raised your hand, please. Yes, I did. I'm, I, I want to see if I could have a little input since I didn't get any questions. No, I, I, on the last question, um, I, I, believe, I, I believe Alexandra stated it correctly when she mentioned that these new plant breeding techniques are more precise, less costly, and can be done in a faster way. But I'd like to tie it with what Professor Dieter mentioned about substantial equivalence. And when we're talking about the risk to the environment, if you have a end product that is substantially equivalent to one that has been produced through conventional breeding, then the risk that you should apply to it should be equal. And I think uh, Professor D Dieter also talked about this when we ta he talked about the precautionary principle and how constant it needs to be. So I guess I wanted to chime in a little bit on the risk assessment and how a regulation can be risk-based. Yeah, thank you very much. I think we need to come to close soon because we are just over time and uh, we have still a number of questions, I must say, and now also answers to the questions from in between. <laughs> uh, there's one, maybe one also to, to, I think to Professor, I think to Professor Klein also, maybe just one last question if I could, uh, it, you know, it says, could less product, could less, ah, sorry, could the reduced production of organic farming be in part solved by a better distribution of agricultural productions? Uh, of course, I don't have any research on this, but this seems to be very logically. Um, it's also, we need to produce less waste. We have too much food waste and yes. of course, but may I also add at the end something as microbiologists, there's really very interesting studies showing that for instance, um, the infection of crops and there's only I think 10 or 12 plants we use on the whole earth to get our nutrition from, that the infection by fungi destroys some of these, these harvests by 50%. And this also has a direct effect of the climate change, by the way, only to, it's also a very interesting aspect of course, which we cannot discuss here. Okay, I would like to close at this point. Uh, what we have learned today, I think, and this was very interesting to me also to see the different opinions. We have learned that, let's say, when we start again from Pablo, that in the, let's say, in the developing world, it appears to be a technology, at least what you said, which is, appears to be very important there. At least it is, it is seen as very important for the future of, of nutrition. 
We have learned from uh, from Dr. Mesmer that, of course, there is a is a is a strong tendency also to to organic uh, to solutions in uh, by using the organic agriculture. The question then, of course, which we discussed also is whether we can feed the whole mankind with this solution. We have learned from Professor Dedra, and thank you very much for stepping in. Also, what I found very interesting, because I'm not a lawyer at all, um, about the pre precautionary principle, and that it always needs to be a, a, a balance between benefit and risk. And what I've learned from you, what I liked, is that also this needs to include what is happening when you do not take when you do not use the benefit so it's not only in case that to use it but what happens when you do not use it and this is what i've learned and of course also professor klein thank you very much for your perspective also to show us the ecological perspective i think is very important and also that it i, I think it might not be related i hope no i, have, I have, do not interpret otherwise shout at me it, it, is, it, is a, it is a systematic problem of agriculture and is not related really to the use of the technology. Can I say that? I think so. Only technology, you know. Okay. With this also, of course, to the audience, and I'm really sorry, we had a lot. It was a very interesting session and we had a lot of questions and I could only pick a couple of them because there were just too many. Thank you very much to all of you for listening and to joining us. And tomorrow we will continue and I hope to see you all tomorrow morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for you.